Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. I am really excited to be here. I love the history of medicine, but I really love the history of cardiology. And there is so much of it in these uh, surrounding blocks and all that we went through today. Uh, really in incredible and quite an honor to be here. Um, I I'm a clinical cardiologist. So I, I do things with uh, HCM. I'm the director of both HCM and the sports cardiology um, the league, and this is a shameless plug for our HCM and sports cardiology fellowship. I know there are fellows here, even if you're not interested and you know folks, we are looking for another one for next July. Uh, and and it, it is, a, it, it, I think, quite an experience. These are my disclosures. This is what I do. Um, I take care of patients two and a half to three days a week. And then I do imaging, mostly by cardiac MRI and by um, ECHO the remainder of the time. And I work, uh, because of HCM, I do some advisory board stuff. So let's start with a case. This is how all of my life starts. And this is a 17 year old, it's a real athlete. She's a female American soccer midfielder. She has no symptoms, no prior syncope, no cardiovascular limitations. She's an elite level athlete, no cardiomyopathies, no family history of cardiomyopathy, no prior history of cardiac arrest. And she underwent a pre-participation physical exam and an ECG. Here's our electrocardiogram. I'll give you a second to look at that. Certainly not a diagnostic dilemma here, right? Grossly abnormal, deep T wave inversions, out through V6. This should jump off the page at you. And of course, based on this, with or without symptoms, cardiac imaging is required. A normal biventricular function, her wall motion and, uh, was normal, no valve disease, no mitral valve prolapse or SAM, and she had a 17 millimeter septal thickness. She went on for an exercise echo. We do mostly CPET with these. I can ramp them long distance, sprint them, and no arrhythmias, normal heart rate and blood pressure response. And I did an ambulatory monitor. It was actually, I think, longer than 48 hours, but I called it 48 hours here, no arrhythmias. She went on for cardiac MR, no surprises. 18 millimeter thick septum, no LGE, no SCAR, hyperdynamic function. And then she sent to us for an evaluation, right? She felt fine. And now we have put her life completely on hold. And the question is, what do you do? Based on an athlete, asymptomatic, detected, can she play sport? So sudden cardiac arrest in sports is not new, right? This has been happening for decades. We're seeing more wins than we've ever seen before, more survivals than we've ever seen before. And we'll talk about why that is at the end. But clearly this started about 2006 in the United States when the NBA was the first league to initiate cardiac screening. This was uh, done by Barry Marin and a group of three where they would evaluate all athletes. At the same time, FIFA did the same. And in FIFA, it was driven specifically by these two events. Nicholas Ferrer on the right, who had uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and Mark Vivian Foy, who ended up with, a, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, both died suddenly on the field and it really jarred the sport, right? In Europe, this is a very big deal and it jarred them, should we be playing? How do we do this safer? What are we missing along the way? And then since then, we've seen the last several decades where the NCAA tried to push for this. They talked about EKG screening. There was a lot of pushback regarding that. And then I ended up helping with some delivery and employment of an NCAA checklist to try and improve emergency action plans along with many of the sports medicine doctors all the professional leagues do some level of screening. And of course, in Europe, they do the same thing. So cardiac assessment, cardiac management of the athlete is absolutely part of how we manage athletes these days. So I was telling uh, Carrie earlier that I, I thought I would be an orthopedic surgeon when I went into med school and I, I just didn't like it. I wanted to manage athletes. I wanted to participate in them. And I thought, well, I guess I'll have to find some other way and, and ended up falling into this. And now cardiovascular care of the athlete is truly a team sport. It includes the athlete, the sports medicine doc, and the sports cardiologist is now firmly ingrained in how we manage athletes. Thankfully, I'm not at every game. I don't have, I mean, I could be if I wanted to, but I, I don't want to be. And uh, um, th these are few and far between, but managing athletes really requires a cardiologist. So which athletes are at risk? So if you look overall at the data, the men's basketball, I'm sorry, this is NCAA data uh, from 2015, and men's basketball is at the top of that list, and it varies based on what sport you are participating in. So some groups are at higher risk than others. Overall, we typically quote somewhere around one in 50,000. So fairly rare 
overall with all the athletes participating. We know that men are at higher risk than women. In fact, about four times the risk of women and nearly 90% of the deaths happen in men. So this is a group we have to spend more time understanding. We don't know why that is, but there's clearly a higher risk signal in men. We know that American style football, male basketball, and male soccer have the highest risk for sudden cardiac death compared to all other sports. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't play these sports. I'm not suggesting that we should ban football here in Texas, but I am saying that this is a group that we should be worried about and at least be mindful that this is a group that may have higher risk. We know that African-American or self-described self black athletes are at significantly higher risk than white athletes. So again, we don't understand this. There's more work to be done in this group, but these are the groups that we should be more concerned about male athletes, black athletes, and these three sports are the groups that we should spend as much time on those as the others, but maybe a little more focus about what the potential harms may be during sport itself. We know that some diseases are at higher risk. So you can have an acquired anomaly. We've certainly learned a lot about myocarditis over the last several years, more than I think we wish we ever did. Uh, acquired diseases or electrical diseases for, for those who are EP bound, WPW and long QT syndrome are clear important parts of sudden death, and then structural abnormalities where hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has long been described as the most common cause of sudden death in young athletes. And this is where that data comes from, robust data, 1980 to 2005, mostly written by Dr. Marin with tons of updates, 2007, 2009, and 2016, over 2,400 athletes and nearly 850 deaths. And the story has been largely the same mostly because the data and the message have, have been from the same draw. So I'm, I'm here to tell you that we've learned more in the last decade or so, and actually contemporary estimates of risk for sudden death challenge that prior data. And this is why you may think all that is done in cardiology is done. There is so much more we don't understand and things we think that are dogma are clearly not. So if you look at the NCAA data, the UK, the military or FIFA data, you can see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is still important, but it is definitely a smaller piece of this pie compared to other, compared to what we previously thought. It nowhere near dominates the landscape for risk for sudden death. In fact, what really dominates it is sudden unexplained death or SUD, or what we sometimes refer to as SADS. This is the, 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 uh, a signal that we've got more work to do, right? There's more information to sort out what might be included in that group. So how do we identify them? How do we identify those who might be at risk? Certainly if you have kids in the audience, you know this story, whether you're a high school, a collegiate or elite athlete, we're gonna use pre-participation physical exam, a cardiovascular screening, PPE, a comprehensive family history, a three generation story, and a comprehensive exam with the AHA 14 point. And then additional testing as you see fit, an ECG, an echo, or, or a cardiac MRI. So if you look at how the leagues are doing it across the world, a few of them are still doing a combine, but remember that in the NFL combine, we do about 300 athletes and only about 150 of them are gonna get drafted. So the majority of them that are there are never gonna play at an elite level for a whole bunch of reasons. Some of that is talent and some of that is injury, but everybody who is doing this is doing an ECG and an echo predominantly, and then a little bit of functional study, a little bit of stress testing to evaluate those athletes. So clearly at that elite level where their resources are independent and, and plentiful, using a history, physical and ECG are an important part of how we evaluate them. But if you go all the way back to 1996, when this was initially described by, by Barry Marin and others, the American Heart Association was recommending pre-participation physicals. They said it's the best available and the most practical approach for screening populations. And it, it still intrinsically lacks the capability to reliably identify potential lethal cardiovascular abnormalities. So we even knew then more of what we knew, what we know now, that this is going to be a difficult way to be sure that we're evaluating and completely managing all of these athletes. So we wrote about this in 2016, and we said that it's still important to do that comprehensive physical exam. You can still find stuff, murmurs, abnormal uh, blood pressures, and a good family history can still elicit 
some findings that put individuals at risk. And then if you're gonna do an ECG, it really has to be with us included. It ought to be multidisciplinary with skilled cardiovascular oversight and somebody, she or he, who is an expert in interpreting those imaging because the field continues to evolve. And I'm gonna show you some evolution in a little bit. The base, the skill experience to interpret the athlete ECG is very difficult and continues to, to, to evolve. So this is the sort of ECG, right? Where we, where, where that may be put in front of you, which is actually a normal ECG, despite this being uh, called abnormal by the read. This is a normal repolarization phenomenon in an athlete, nothing that should make you nervous. So if you look at the last 10 years of evolution, we have learned more about the ECG in the athlete than we did in the previous 50 to understand what a physiologic adaptation is. We now know that the international criteria, at least at present, is the current gold standard. There's no plans to change that that I'm aware of in the, in the next couple of years. We are writing competitive sports guidelines that, are, that will be out, we think, in about 18 months but no changes to ECG criteria. We've gotten better at accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. So what you'll hear about is this, that our false positive rate has gone down quite a bit, all the way down to about a one to 2% false positive rate. So that's impressive, right? We've gotten better about knowing what is truly abnormal and not. So it does depend on the disease, the prevalence of the condition. HCM is obviously important in this disease, but if you get down to ARVC, anomalous coronaries, or even long QT syndrome, it's not as good. And even if we do it, do we care, right? Is there any impact with using these ECG screening? So this is maybe the most comprehensive and the largest study that will ever be done. Over 11,000 athletes, 15 to 17, this is all done in Europe history and physical and ECG to an echo on everybody. And they followed them for 20 years. About 2% had congenital valve disease, 42 or less than a half percent had findings that could be associated with sudden cardiac arrest. And of those 42, 23 died. And then eight of the 23 had died from cardiac causes. So despite having a risk for sudden cardiac arrest, very few of them ended up dying from it. And of those only a few more ended up dying from cardiomyopathy. But what's important is that six of them were not identified at screening. So that should make us all pause, right? We did this to try and improve things and we didn't do much with it. So that's the impact. So these, this is the data from their study looking at those individuals. And I'll point to you, the initial screening result was negative and then two subsequent blinded interpretations also read these as negative. So even after we knew there was an event and you were scrutinizing that ECG, we still had trouble finding any problem with that ECG. And then look at the distance between when it happened, a couple of months after to more than a decade in a couple of them. So it might mean that, that one ECG is not enough, probably, but it also, it, it also should tell us that improvement in diagnosis for sure, I, proved, I showed you that, but improvement in survival, not so much, right? We haven't impacted anyone's living longer by doing this, and we still haven't. But there is some potential risk for harm. So this is the part that's a little controversial, and I'm happy to take stones at the end of this. But if you dive into that ECG criteria that got us to that one to 2%, you're gonna see over 5,000 athletes were incorporated in that first study, looking at comparing Seattle and international criteria. And the majority of them were white. And they found 1.6% international criteria. That's where that one to one, 2% false positive rate came from. But it's in that slighted group. If you look at this larger population, 11,000 athletes, again, international criteria, false positive rate, somewhere between 1.5 and, and 2%. You can see if you separate them out between the white and the black athletes, you get a different story. The majority of them are men, the majority of them are white. So incorporating that and applying that to women and, and applying that to non-white individuals is gonna be problematic. So if you use this criteria, 1.5% white, but almost three and a half percent false positive rates. So more than twice the likelihood that you're going to identify somebody as abnormal, even though they are actually normal. These are false positives. So if you use Dave Engel's data from 2018, we published this in uh, looking at the, the athletes uh, in the NBA, and you look, what they described was about 15% African-American false positives and about 11% abnormal 
uh, in the white group, but that was actually within their same race. So that compared the number of false positives amongst African-Americans or amongst whites, and they separated that. But the total athletes is really what we care about. That's over 520 of them. And you can see almost 80% of the NBA is African-American. So if you apply this same logic and you look at the total, 11 out of 519, the white false positive rate's about 2%, and we're at 12.5% if you're African-American. So consider the unintended consequences, right? Six times the likelihood of disqualifying somebody who has a normal ECG. Now in the NBA, it doesn't matter, right? I can get an echo and an MRI in three hours. Even at Texas Heart Institute, that's gotta be a challenging thing to pull off. To be able to get an echo and an MRI that soon is really difficult. In the NBA, we can do that all day long because they have infinite resources. But if you're an individual who doesn't have that level of resource, that's going to be a problem. And I use my own example. So I grew up on the east end of Long Island in a small town. And if I had said to my dad, hey, dad, good news, right? I have this abnormal ECG. All I have to do is see a cardiologist and I can play basketball. He would have said to me, well, I guess you're not playing basketball. We didn't have that sort of resource. That would never have happened in our family. So there are some significant harm that could be related to this. Let's talk about cardiac imaging. Physiology is really what excites me and that's what drew me towards uh, cardiology in total. And cardiac imaging plays an important role in athletes. So when you think about ca cardiac remodeling, this is a slide I borrow from Aaron Bagish, we can separate this into endurance athletes where they have massive sustained cardiac output, higher four to five times th th than they are at rest massive increases in stroke volume. So that volume change causes the ventricle to get bigger. In many ways, this is like aortic insufficiency. So that large amount of regurgitation falls into the ventricle and the more it has to then squeeze out and the ventricle then compensates by getting bigger to handle that extra volume. If you're a strength athlete, then you have repetitive increases in systolic blood pressure. Muscle contraction and vasoconstriction leads to a pressure challenge, just like we see with aortic stenosis. So the ventricle tries to compensate for that by getting thicker along the way. And that thickness is then a physiologic adaptation of the athlete. Just like you see in every other part of, of, of cardiology, the heart is compensating for this physiologic adaptation. So we looked at this in the NFL athletes. This is 2011 to 2013, and about 10% had thickness above 11 millimeters. So uh, 13, 14 millimeters, but you can see nothing above 15 millimeters. We looked at this in the NBA in the same story, about 10% ended up being in the 13, 14 millimeter range. But again, you see a pretty hard cutoff, nothing above 15 millimeters. So appropriate for you to think about cutoffs in terms of wall thickness. Anything 15 millimeters above is pathologic until proven otherwise. I will tell you getting this from longstanding hypertension is still very difficult. Most of the data on that, anything at 16, 17 and above is very unlikely to be hypertension induced. Now, the, the type of athlete matters too. Those are a different group than here. This is the soccer athletes. If you look at the distribution of wall thickness in US soccer players, about a third of the women and about 40% of the men were above the upper limit of normal. So if you use that standard cutoff, you're going to disqualify folks if you're doing this in soccer players. So why is this important? If you see a 14 millimeter thick septum in a soccer player, it's possibly abnormal, more likely than you would see in an NFL football player. The 14s and the, and the Jets players, we disregard all the time. If you're a soccer player and it's thick at 14, I'm gonna spend some time making sure I'm not missing early hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then they, you also see changes based on age. So you can see under 17, we had the US men's team here and the women's team, 18 to 20 and above 21, the wall thickness can change and the end diastolic volume can change. So not just the thickness, but the size of the ventricle matters too. This is old data from around this parts, 2004, looking at cyclists who I think are maybe some of the most difficult along with rowers to take care of because they are both strong and they are fit. They, they can do both strength activities as well as 
uh, endurance athletes, so their ventricles get both thick and dilated. And you can see about half of them had over 60 millimeter size by, by echo, huge, right? By most of our standards. And the majority of them had ejection fraction over 55, but you can dip into that low normal range is what we would call that 45 to 50% low 43s, 44s, but nothing under 40. So pathologic in this size, in terms of ejection fraction, under 40 for sure, but the vast majority of the ejection fraction should be normal. If you go back to those giant NBA players, again, a third over 60 millimeters. So huge, these are massive ventricles. And it actually has some impact on them when they're done because they try and get life insurance and they apply with a 63 millimeter size ventricle and they say, I don't think so, man, this is not normal. And then we have to try and undo some of that. And remember the majority of these were, were normal ejection fraction. In, in this group, we only had three or four that had ejection fractions under 50%. And it's physiology, right? It's the increased stroke volume from that, from those bigger ventricles that allow this to happen. So you should expect when you see an athlete that their stroke volume should be 110, 120 or so, as opposed to the normal people, right? More like 80 or 85 or below. And then of course the pathologic ventricles are usually smaller than that. So they compensate by increasing stroke volume. So this is a paper we wrote in 2020. And I point this out only because unlike the thickness, if you look at all of the data, no matter where you're looking across sport and across the pond, the cutoff values for left ventricular and diastolic volumes, they don't apply unlike they do with thickness. So you can have a hard stop at 15 millimeters for thickness, but when the ventricles get bigger, it's much more challenging. You've got to do a little more work to sort through that. And when possible, use gender and sports specific normative data to try and make sure you know what's normal or not. Now the right ventricle does the same thing and in some ways even worse. So the right ventricle is huge in many of the endurance athletes. If you use uh, this data from 2012, if you look, you look at the RV inflow or the RV outflow and you use standard ASC cutoffs, you're gonna give lots of pathology that isn't there. 60% on the inflow and 40% on the, on the outflow. This is an expected normal physiologic adaptation to all of that increased exercise that they have to do. The forgotten ventricle is becoming more important in other aspects, and it certainly is in athletes, maybe more important in, in the athletic population for pushing blood through the system compared to the left ventricle. So the structural changes are physiologic adaptations. They occur in the left ventricle with, uh, uh, with thickening, with or without concentric or eccentric. Either one can be possible. The left, the left ventricle can dilate with or without hypertrophy. They're not exclusive one or the other. And the right chamber can of course dilate as well. And lots of pieces to that puzzle. So the athlete's heart can come based on how old you are, what sport discipline you do, how big you are, and where your family is from, where your genes are from will have some impact on what those look like. So using normative data is gonna be critical for you when you're evaluating your athletes. And then sorting out between what's a physiologic adaptation and a pathologic adaptation is that gray zone. Is this cardiomyopathy? Is this RV cardiomyopathy? What we're now calling arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in order to provide another level of complexity to, the, to this already complex group. And remember that diastolic function in general is preserved in this group. The diastology is super important. If you're an endurance athlete, you'd expect to see a medial E prime at 14 or 15. If you're a strength athlete, it may dip into the tens but it's, only, it's never above, uh, 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 lower than eight. And when it is, it is pathologic until proven otherwise. It is our opportunity to sort through that. I had an HCM patient this week. I met her uh, as a follow-up. I met her when she was 14. Her reprime velocity was, four, was 14 then. She has gene positive. Two years later, it dropped to 10. This year when I saw her, it was eight. She still has normal wall thickness. She's gene positive. I think something's coming. So that's important for you to know that this is changing and the diastology really matters. Spending time not skipping through the tissue Doppler really can have some value when you're, when you're determining athlete versus pathologic. Strain matters as well. Usually more, the more negative strain, the better, certainly in the endurance athletes. And you can look to see the different patterns of it's a septal HCM or an apical HCM. Sometimes you can't see the tip very well with 2D, but if you do strain over the top of it, it makes me feel better. We do strain on all the soccer and the NBA athletes as a matter of routine evaluation. 
And I typically don't get nervous until it's under minus 15%. That's almost always pathologic until proven otherwise. But of course, look at your tracking, make sure you look at the signal. Sometimes garbage in is truly garbage out. So for a sports cardiologist, separating the ECG and the echo physiologic adaptation from pathologic adaptation is really critical. This is where the rubber meets the road and knowing this is really critical for, for athlete evaluations. So athlete screening is here to stay and ECG is likely to be included in that going forward, like it or not. I, I obviously have some reservations about what some of those risks may be. I think echo imaging is gonna be included for those higher risk groups. We clearly have some more work to be done. When do you start? How often do you repeat them? How often do you repeat them? All of the leagues have made it up. And I know that because I've made it up with them. We've written those guidelines and said, every two years seems reasonable, maybe every year in some aspects, but the vast majority of the time we have just guessed. And then finding an expert to do this is really challenging. Pediatric cardiologists are hard to get into. Some, at least where we are, we have 10. It's a three to five month wait often to get into a new patient evaluation. So that can be tragic for an athlete. And I'll show you what that looks like. Who, when, and how to handle the findings is important. And then what's the goal? If it's for safety, well, we haven't been able to prove that, right? We're not saving anybody's life by obtaining an ECG. If it's for disqualification and medical legal, I'm out, right? I have no interest in doing that because the athletes are just going to push back. They're going to lie to you. They're not going to tell you about their family history. They're going to do, you, they're going to do to you what they do to me at the combine. They're going to bring you somebody else's ECG, right? They're going to, at the combine, they'll often say, well, I had sh shoulder surgery on my right shoulder. I'm like, no, it's your left. You know, everything says the left. No, no, it's my right. I can see the scar on your left side. <laughs> but they want you to image the normal stuff because they're afraid you're going to disqualify them. So we have to have some open dialogue, otherwise we lose them. So if it's diagnosis, risk stratification, and develop a surveillance and a safety plan, well, then I'm in. That's a whole different animal when we're talking about managing athletes when it comes to evaluations and screening, because we don't want this to be a barrier to participation. If the ECG is between me and participating in sports, I'm going to tell you whatever you want to hear in order to get on that field. So we have to create a, an environment that doesn't seek disqualification or look for elimination, because the athletic season is finite. If you have an abnormal ECG and it takes me four or five months to get in to see somebody and I miss my first six weeks for a normal ECG, that's a real problem. So in, in Florida, these are mandated. I just had a, a young athlete fly up to see me. It cost them about $10,000 in imaging studies where they were to come up with an inconclusive diagnosis. Another two grand to come fly to see me. The mom bought an AED the day before she came up because we told them you might die. So now she's really freaked out. And it turned out this was just an abnormal ECG. He had no hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Still having the AED is reasonable, but we have to do a better job than that. If we're gonna use ECG, it's really fraught with error because the purpose is to mitigate risk, right? It's designed to individualize patient-centered driven care, what we should really all be seeking, seeking in total, moving away from what we did in 2005 and moving away from terms like disqualification and ineligible and, and not allowed are, are terms that are my least favorite and moving more towards a advocate for risk assessment, moving away from the yes or no and looking for the true gray zone in all of this and shift, shifting away from this traditional pattern where negative screen, off you go, positive screen, disqualified and moving more towards an evaluation, a diagnosis, a risk stratification and shared decision-making, which is what we do in virtually everything we do now. And it's an approach where we're, hopefully you're using this across the board in everything that we do in medicine and certainly within cardiology, moving away from that paternalistic, it's my idea, you do this, moving away from informed consent and moving into informed choice where the athlete or the individuals can be part of that decision so you know kind of who they are. And we wrote about this in 2021 where we talked about the, the shields of sports cardiology, all of the pillars that go into how you manage it and how important shared decision-making is in this group. And it, it's a new term, but it, it's an old concept. This is from Ben Levine at UT Southwestern, uh, close to here, who wrote about this in 1994. And what you don't know is the medical history of this is that it got him in real trouble. Got him in real trouble with, with, with the cardiology community when he was saying, it's okay to in include the athlete 
for the role of physician and individual assumption of risk, because what you're doing is telling them what you think their risk is and what their risk tolerance is, is all about. And we're talking about, are you walking up a hill? Is this a hike for just you and I? Or are we going up Everest, right? Is this a significant risk? But most people survive this. If, if you prepare for it, it's about a two to 3% risk as opposed to K2, where very few people survive it, right? Very few, only about 320 people have ever gotten to the top. Now that's what a serious risk looks like and putting that into terms that they understand. So what, what I think about is that when I read about this, this is a slide from Rachel Lampert. She and I called each other and I said, 16 years old, sailing around the world, that's crazy. Would I ever let anybody do that? Well, somebody did, right? Somebody felt like this was okay to do it. We're right here in the great state of, uh, of, of football, right? This is a this is a football heaven. Would you let your your son or daughter play football? And, and this is a controversy that's been ongoing for several years. All of my kids play sports. I was telling Carrie, my middle one just signed to play baseball at Baylor. So I'll be making a lot of flights down here over the next several years. So we're really excited about that. This is a big Texas week for the Martinez family. And in our own family, we struggle with this. So I have a 22 year old who is traveling overseas for six months. She was in Switzerland at the time and said, dad, I want to go skydiving. And I said, look, you know, you're you're 21. I know you're in college and I don't really want you to do it. I think this is a bad idea. I don't know anything about the safety they are there. I'm uncomfortable with it. So about three days later, I got this picture. <laughs> she said, I think the caption was shared decision making this dad. So uh, well, she did it. She did very, very well. She said, I weighed your opinion. I certainly understood it. And I decided to skydive anyway. She's now applying to MD, PhD programs. I did tell her that she's out of the will, however, completely for this. So everyone's individual assumption of risk is up to you, right? You get to decide what that risk is. We certainly see this in cardiothoracic surgery. You guys are a huge second opinion place. Other places, they shouldn't do the surgeries that you do routinely, as do we, because the surgeons there are not capable of doing it. And that's okay. They haven't done enough of those. So the individual risk depends on the person, she or he, who is determining that risk. And in this case, it's the athlete's risk. So many athletes are saying, I want to play anyway. We're clearing more athletes than we've ever done before. Many of them are becoming very, very public about those decisions, just like they have with other things in their life. I guess Twitter and, and Facebook or whatever, for all of its faults, this is certainly making this more public. And more athletes are saying, I kind of want to play anyway. So I'm not saying shared decision making is for everyone, right? Not every single thing can, can be done this way. The athlete doesn't tell me what to do any more than I tell the athlete what to do. We determine what their risk looks like. And sometimes I tell them RV cardiomyopathies is one of those examples where if you exercise, if you're running most marathons, it's going to get worse. This is going to lead to poorer outcomes. And you'd be surprised. Many athletes will say, that's okay, right? I'm not going to be a professional football player. I'm not going to be a professional soccer player and I'm willing to stop. And they, they are able to engage in that conversation. They're smarter than we give them credit to. I absolutely bring in their families. I absolutely bring in the institutions and the coaches, but this is a story we've seen with long QT syndrome, right? For those of you doing this a long time, 25 years ago, long QT syndrome was a stop, right? Can't do any more, really consider an ICD you're in real trouble. And we now know better than that. And Mike Ackerman and others, these are from Peter Aziz from Cleveland Clinic, looking at long QT syndrome and what we now know to be in general, a lower cardiac event rate when managed correctly, depending on the type of long QT you have, maybe a beta blocker, maybe an ICD, but the story has changed because we looked into it a little bit deeper. So for HCM, it's done the same. In the 2020 guidelines, we updated and said, we want you to exercise. Mild to moderate exercise is appropriate and it's beneficial. It's actually absolutely after being seen by an expert, shared decision-making has to be part of that discussion, but it's an individual assumption of risk. You evaluate what their individual risk is, not the global HCM, but your HCM. That's all they really care about anyway, and making decisions based on that, because there are clear benefits with exercise. We know that VO2 max is the best predictor of outcomes in every single disease ever, whether it's cardiac, 
whether it's oncology, it doesn't matter what it is. The more fit you are, the better you will do. There are clear psychosocial benefits with exercise. There are some mental health aspects that, that are improved with, with exercise. And of course, weight loss, improved metabolic profile, high blood pressure. This is absolutely our best drug to manage those with any kind of disease, including HCM. So let's go back to our athlete, our 17 year old. Again, no diagnostic dilemma, no symptoms, abnormal ECG, clearly with deep T wave inversions and her echo confirmed the same 17 millimeter thick septum, no obstruction based on her exercise echo, no abnormal arrhythmias and no high risk features based on her MRI. So clearly HCM, nobody's debating that. Whether or not she can participate in play is what I proposed to you when we started. So the message amongst athletes has been confusing over the last 25 years. So this is one of the earlier task force eights that described athlete exercise, right? This is old news. And we would tell athletes that they were supposed to exercise, but not a whole lot. But when we wrote about it, we told them they could participate in sport, you know, all the ones down here in this bottom green. So everything else was off limits. That's, there's not a lot of cricket, I imagine, down here. The curling community here in Houston is horrific, I imagine. So th this doesn't. This is a confusing message. And as a result of that, they're less active than everybody else in the United States. 60% said it negatively impacted their emotional well-being, and they had psychologic morbidity associated with it, especially amongst the elite and competitive athletes. We're telling them they can't play anymore, a sport they spent their entire life trying to compete in, and 55% of them do not meet minimum physical exercise capacity. So as a result, they're heavier, they have worse, they have worse outcomes. We are literally making them sicker by confusing this message. So we now have some more solid data. So this is exercise in HCM from the RESET trial, 2017, it was published at over 130 athletes. An older group, about 50, 16 weeks of moderate intensity, and they had a little bit of an increase in exercise capacity. And remember, many of them are on high dose beta blockers, so no surprise, there wasn't too much of an increase in VO2 max. But there were no adverse events. That's really the important part. There was no deaths, no sudden cardiac arrest, no defibrillator shocks, and no sustained arrhythmia in either group. There was no difference, no matter whether they exercised or not. They looked at 35 patients, a younger group, mostly white, lower risk by ESC risk score, almost a decade full of follow-up. And again, whether they stopped or continued sport, no difference in terms of outcomes. The only sudden death was in a tennis player who wasn't playing tennis. So it was just chance, right? So it had nothing to do with participating. So what we advocated in 21 was to do this, was to evaluate them. What kind of sport do they do? Uh, uh, who are they, what's their age and their ethnicity, and then do testing to determine, is this a physiologic adaptation we started with or a pathologic adaptation and deciding after that for shared decision-making, what do you do next? And then developing a clinical plan for exercise prescription. You notice I didn't say disqualify or not disqualify. I said develop an exercise plan. Because even if you can't play in the NBA or you can't play in the NFL, there are lots of reasons that's, that's going to be that you can't participate, but I still want you to exercise. I still need to develop some process to keep you healthy. So how do I do it? First and foremost, you have to decide, are you the right person to do it, right? You've got lots of experts locally. Are you the person who should be conveying the message of risk? Are you truly the expert to determine what to do next? I do this all the time with surgery and I do this with PCI. I say, you should really ask she or he who's gonna do this. If they're gonna, if that's the person you're gonna ask what their, what their risk is, not me. I'll tell you what it's globally described as but I can't tell you individually what their risk might be. And then involve the patient, in this case, the athlete. All parties should be in agreement. Include them in part of this discussion about what that risk may look like. And then no covert operations. The coaches, the athletic trainers, they all have to be involved. And then utilizing a personal AED is important. I want them to engage in their own safety. So I will often say to them, it's about 1500 bucks. We can help with this from an insurance standpoint. But if you wanna play, participate in it and get your own AED. Most of them are spending $500 on a glove, a couple of thousand dollars on other equipment. So another 1500 bucks for an AED seems like an easy lift. And then for all of us, you got to document risks, 
potential harms, even if they have an AED. Sometimes these don't go as well as we want them to. And then make sure they know that we're not done, right? I'll see you in a year. We're going to do planned surveillance. We're going to look to see what that risk may change over time. But ultimately, somebody's got to make the final decision, right? Who ends up making the final decision is important. And it's been solidly locked in about who does it. And it really should be everyone. All parties are in agreement. The expert provider, all those that are taking care of the athlete should be engaged in that final decision. But for over 25 years, NAP versus Northwestern has been the reason this has occurred. So this was a young man who had an ICD and wanted to participate in basketball at Northwestern and was told you can't. This became now the legal precedent. And it's often misquoted. So I want to try and clear up some of that. So what they determined not was that Northwestern was right and not that, that the athlete was wrong, but that it was clear that they didn't violate the Rehabilitation Act. They, it was not against the law based on the Rehabilitation Act, the AHA, uh, the American Disabilities Act, that the athlete could not participate in play. They were not saying that they were correct, but they were saying that everyone should do this a little bit different. This is in their final conclusion, right? Not buried in the middle. This is their final say. This sounds like shared decision-making. Everyone's gonna do it a little bit different. The resources at a power five are different than the resources at a division three. No one will argue that, right? There are definitely differences between those two. And then it can't just be because you said so, right? I'm scared. I don't want to do this. It has to be based on evidence, expert input, expert review, not just because I said so or because the team's never done it before. That's just not how we do it. So think about it like this. Put the athlete in the middle, just like you would the patient, right in the center of what we evaluate. And the team physician is going to take all the inf information in and determine what to do. And it's going to come from the family, the treating doc, some experts, some guidance from uh, uh, published documents, institu institutional stakeholders, and, and all of them should be incorporated in that. And then Within that should be a risk assessment. What's that individual's risk? Because each one's just a little bit different. And then what do the guidelines say? Because the guidelines 25 years ago were different for virtually everything we do, whether it's a beta blocker for heart failure or not, whether it's uh, chemotherapy or, or whether or not it's how we manage athletes. And then the team physician will sort through that. None of that's changed. We're not suggesting that it does, but what goes into that discussion has absolutely changed. <laughs> But the experts should be telling them, making a shared decision-making discussion, and then again, developing a return to play or a return to exercise plan. If they can't participate, if they choose not to participate, we don't want them becoming an expert in Doritos and gaming and, and whatnot. We still want them to exercise for their own life because this is still important. And that's what the guidelines reflected too. That was a 2B recommendation, which was our signal to say, if you're not an expert, you should refer out and get somebody involved who might be. Competitive sports should be considered, but you have to convey the risk of sudden death. You have to make sure you have a shared decision-making discussion with that individual about what their risk might be because we're really better at this than we've ever been. The data's changed because our evaluation tools are better. This is how we manage sudden cardiac arrest in HCM in everyone. We now know that thicker, unexplained syncope or arrhythmic syncope, LV apical aneurysms, LV dysfunction, scar, and ambulatory monitor VT goes into the risk for sudden death in HCM. And Marty Marin and others looked at this, almost 2,100 uh, patients, not athletes in total, almost five years of follow-up, about 0.8% had sudden death and a very low annual mortality, 99% survival without an ICD. So if you risk stratify folks, you can, turns out you can really keep them safer than we've ever done before. We, using this model, which is now the standard of care, averted nearly all sudden death and had a sensitivity approaching 100%, well over 95%. So we're better than we've ever been at evaluating evaluating those who are at risk for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then this, this past year, we saw two big studies come out. This is from Live HCM, looking at over 1,600 athletes. They were both vigorous activity and non-vigorous activity, and they were uh, on average about 40 years old, 80% were above the age of 25. So this is that recreational group, right? This is the non-elite level athlete, but this is what most of our patients are. And they were mostly white, which I think is a flaw, but about 90% of them that were enrolled were, were 
were included. And what you see is that they had virtual overlaps between the two patterns. Whether you exercised or didn't, 1,600 total athletes and had no impact. So no increase in, in, in events, whether you were an athlete or not, and vigorous activity was included in that as well. And then we looked at elite level athletes. So covertly, we were all sort of quietly allowing some of those athletes to play. We looked at, we published this in, in, in uh, Jack uh, earlier this year, looking at return to play for elite level athletes with sudden cardiac death. And actually the lead author is the, uh, the, the, the sky jumper from earlier tonight. My daughter helped, helped put all this information together with me. So we, we did keep her at least in the family despite uh, completely ignoring me. And we looked at 76 athletes and they were a much younger group, average age around 20, more than a third of them were, were, were uh, African-American athletes and about 50% were, were hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The other major group was long QT syndrome. And what in this group of what I would argue is elite level athletes, over two thirds are division one, NCAA athletes, another third are professional athletes. And no surprise, nearly three quarters of them were initially told you can't play. So they were initially disqualified for their disease. Then they sought out a second opinion at one of the four centers, ours, Mayo Clinic, Atrium Health in North Carolina and Mass General. And then all but 4% of them then went on to participate in play. And what's important is that one of them had a breakthrough cardiac event with exercise and two of them had breakthrough cardiac events without exercise, reminding us that this is just chance we had no deaths in this disease, in, in this cohort at all. And if you go back to what they played, you can see none of them were cricket or bowlers or riflery men or women. They were all in the high risk, elite level concerning athletes. And they fell in those categories. And despite that, they did very well. So we're not suggesting that they can all participate in sport, don't worry. We're suggesting that even in those elite levels, we should offer them the opportunity to be risk stratified, to be evaluated by an expert, and then to have shared decision-making, something to involve them in that discussion about what their potential risk is and what that university might be comfortable with. Because playing with, with HCM is important. Autonomy in healthcare is important. Absolute risk is difficult to quantify in this disease and taking it away leads to loss of self-identity, scholarship, income, depression, mental health disease, all comes with removing that group that they're all connected to. So what I'd submit to you is that for those with cardiovascular disease, create an exercise plan that's individual based on their risk factors, who they are, what their symptoms are, what their exercise testing performance are, and then what their patient risk aversion is. You could not beg me to get out of a plane and jump out with a, with a parachute on, but she was all in and she's done it since then before that, since then as well, uh, and figure out what sport she, that they are considering and then talk to them about all those aspects. And I do this at every visit. What do they eat? How do they hydrate? Are they aerobic? Are they anaerobic? Are they doing both? What's the potential disease related risk factors that we need to control and then make sure that they're in a safe environment. The AED is still critical. Uh, oops, sorry. It's not just the, the younger athletes, it's the older athletes too. So still most of my practice is this older group, the weekend warriors like me between 40 and 65 who still like to exercise and still want to participate in sport. And they've got diseases too, whether it's valvular heart disease, Coronary artery disease is clearly the most important one that we see, but just because you have a heart attack doesn't mean that you can't exercise again. We have to risk stratify you. We have to let your heart heal, but there are opportunities to let people continue to participate in the sport that they love to play, running or cycling or whatever it ends up being. So we should treat them in the same way, share decision-making discussion, a clinical decision based on what their risk is that I would tell you to make sure we include their family just like we do with the young folks. If, if, you're, if you have a, 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 an older athlete, you wanna make sure that their spouse or significant other is aware that you've told them that this is the risk and, and what's going to happen uh, uh, with or without exercise. And finally, there is no perfect evaluation. It's never gonna be perfect. Low risk doesn't mean no risk. Initial events are often a single sudden, sudden cardiac uh, event, an arrhythmic event, commodial cortis. We learned a lot about this for, from Damar. And of course, this is the home of anomalous coronary arteries. And we know we can't screen it away, at least not with an ECG. We can't find it. And this can certainly increase your risk of sudden cardiac arrest. 
And I show this picture of all of these athletes that are obviously fairly famous events over the last 18 months or two years. And what's important about it is A, they, they survived, right? They did very well despite having sudden cardiac arrest. But what's really important about it is that they all underwent cardiac screening. Most of them were screened multiple times. Christian Erickson, more than a decade. I told LeBron, he may, have been ex he may have been imaged more than any other human being alive. He had an ECG and an echo and, and often an MRI every year for the last 20 years while participating in the NBA. And despite that, we could not find what happened to Bronny. So cardiac screening is important, but we have to make sure that you know about an emergency action plan and an AED are still important. That sudden car cardiac uh, death in the athlete is a, often a non-contact collapse. They pass out and then AEDs and CPR are critical. You really only have a couple of minutes to intervene before there's anything left to recover. So my last few, my last slide, important part of the athlete safety, the sports cardiologist understanding adaptations and ECG and cardiac imaging. That shared decision-making is a critical way that we manage athletes whether they have symptoms, no symptoms, valve disease, or HCM, and that we can't forget about the EAP and the emergency action plan and the AEDs. It's really the single best way to keep athletes alive when we're talking about cardiac player health and safety. I'll throw in another shameless plug for ORCA. If you've got young athletes that are between 18 and 35 that are participating in sport, this is a free opportunity for them to be followed long-term. Thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to answer any questions.